Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamps, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian, and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Cosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 240 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined this week by Umar Ahmed of IFL TV. Umar, how you doing, my man? All good, Joey. Been a long time since we've done this. Yeah. It's about time. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Overdue. Um, but like I say, Umar, you know, while the, while the lockdown, while the pandemic has been in play, um, you know, guys like myself and you, we we haven't um, we haven't rested. You know, we've been we've been still putting out content. Obviously, you know, my field slightly different to your field, but you know, you've you've kind of stepped into my field a tiny bit. Obviously, having to do the internet, the internet interviews and stuff like that. Um, how are you? How are you finding it? Obviously, you know, gathering content for IFL during this this you know this crazy time. Well, obviously, it's not ideal. None of us. Um, that's including the four others. I felt ever done a Zoom or Skype interview before, uh, which is quite outstanding. Um, we'd have done the odd phone call interview, for example, if it was with Deontay Wilder or Bob Aaron, where it was a must and we couldn't couldn't reach them. Obviously, if we we're in the UK face to face, but yeah, obviously our content is going to places, getting it, being face to face, getting raw emotions out of people, and obviously discussing fights uh, that happen on a weekly basis so it's been hard to talk to people about stuff and not having that direct face-to-face contact obviously makes it a bit more trickier um, and sort of the, the stories that would gather less pace uh, normally are kind of blown out of proportion by ourselves uh, just to keep the videos going it's not been ideal but at least we're able to work from home so I can't complain too much yeah and I like what you know your, your channel is doing as well obviously in in some cases, digging up fighters that we haven't spoke to or seen for for many many years, and you know, seeing what they're doing now and stuff like that. That's uh, that's content I'm a big fan of. But anyway, um, on last week's show, I hosted it with with former heavyweight world title challenger Eddie Chambers. We basically spent ages and ages speaking about Huey Fury and speaking about fights that we wanna we wanna see take place in the heavyweight division when boxing resumes. That is pretty much what we're going to do here um here this week with with myself and you umar so i pretty much talked all about the heavyweight division and the fights i want to see last week so i'm not going to bore everyone and put them through that again but um we can start at heavyweight if you want to give um you know give 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 us some of the fights that you want to see when boxing resumes i know the big one obviously is um is, is joshua fury i'm guessing but um yeah talk to me about that fight and some others that you may want to see when 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 you know when live boxing is back on our screens well i know dillian white's obviously scheduled to fight alexander Vetkin, but a fight i would like to see is him and andy ruiz whether it happens i don't know because white's so high up with the wbc and in line for that shot so whether you take another risk with Ruiz I don't know whether that's the wisest thing but I definitely would like to see that fight I think it's a brilliant fight another one I wouldn't mind seeing is a is a rematch but um it was at Cruiserweight before Uzik and Michael Hunter um I think that's another good fight I just want to see Uzik now in a in a in a proper fight that would be way um you know the the fight which is all uh obviously scheduled and probably will happen whether it's uh with fans or behind closed doors, we don't know yet, but that that fight will probably happen. Um, so it, if I had to go for three, I'd have White, Ruiz, Usyk, um, Hunter, and the obvious one, obviously Fury Joshua. Yeah, some solid choices there. And um, like I say, we've we've gone gone through the heavyweight division there pretty quickly. Moving down to cruiserweight, for me, it's it's a division um, you know that that doesn't get the you know the hype of the heavyweight division nowhere near and to be honest it's it's one of the lost divisions really in boxing there's a lot of talented guys but as you mentioned Usyk there moving up um you know he's he's left he's left a bunch of guys that um you know that 
that, that have all got losses and stuff, and some people just naturally aren't interested. It's a, it's a you know it's a division without that American ingredient, I suppose, at the top level. But um, just looking at that division, I mean, we're going to probably set the same fight here, I'm guessing, and that fight for me would be um, Bradis and Dortico, so uh, Umar. Yeah, I think that's the best fight in the division. I think another one that's kind of going under the radar is uh, Macabre. Obviously, we know he um, suffered that loss uh, against Tony Bowie, but he's put some really good wins together. Um, doesn't really get the, the notice, uh, Macabre, but he's still an active fight in that division and a live opponent. From a British interest, obviously, I'd like to see Lawrence Zaccone and Glavaki happen. Um, I think that fight was going to happen at some point in April. I believe in Chicago, where there's a larger uh, Polish following, and he was looking to stack it, um, stick it on one of them cards. But of course, with this whole situation, that didn't materialise. So I'd say a Koli Glavaki, uh, Brady Stoichos, and um, I think Andrew Tabiti is another guy in the mix as well as uh, Macabre. Maybe a fight between them two. Yeah, yeah, interesting one. Obviously, Tabiti um, found found himself on the deck, didn't he, when he boxed um, Dortikos? Like I say, that was a that was a tough fight for the American there. Like I say, that's probably their, you know, their top guy at cruiserweight. So that's one of the reasons I feel that you know the cruiserweight division doesn't get the recognition. Moving down to light heavy, um, it's a tough one, man. It's a tough one because most people would probably say Baturbiev is the man at that weight now, and. Um, do you want to see him in there with with one of the with one of the other guys? I mean, if if it's going to be anyone, it's surely going to be Bivol. But a lot of people don't like that matchup from what I'm seeing online. I'm surprised at that because I definitely think that's one of the best fights in boxing, um, not just in that division. I think it's the best two in the world, Curry. I think Serbia um, is the man to beat after what he did to Vozdik, um, and I think Dimitri Bivol has looked almost perfect so far. Um, a guy that probably could make super middleweight. So it'll be interesting to see how he fares up against uh, Artur Petoviev and whether the size is going to be a hindrance for him. But that would be the main fight for me to make at 175. Uh, others, I'd like to see Yard again in a big fight, um, challenging one of the world-level guys, whether it's uh, maybe a Jean Pascal or Marcus Brown. Um, and Alvarez, you know, just up there again because whether people say he was getting outclassed against Kovalev or whatever, he he, he nearly bagged that fight. So I wouldn't mind seeing him um, at world level again if he can get through Lyndon Arthur, of course. Uh, that's got to be said. And um, another one I'd like to see is Joshua Boatsy and against uh, one of these guys as well. Um, Again, Marcus Brown, Alvarez, even Kovalev. Um, I don't know whether Kovalev would take that fight because obviously Yard was in a mandatory position. Uh, and that's why that fight happened. But just throw that one in there, Kovalev. Well, see, let's see how that pans out and kind of compare it to, to Yard's performance and see if Boatsy could beat Kovalev. Yeah, it's an interesting one because, again, I was, I was waiting to see if you'd mention him. But for me, you know, in boxing, we talk about the who needs him club. And the guy for me who's at the top of the who needs him club is Callum Johnson. Where does he fit in there? That's a very good chat. And Eddie has talked about making Callum Johnson and Boatsy. Obviously, he's uh, got his European title shot coming up. Um, that's one of the flight. Eddie wants to stage uh, at Matcha in the, in the back garden. Uh, and if he can get that European title, I think him and Boatsy is a massive fight. Um, and uh, possibly maybe in the, the winner could fight at the yard. I think we've got three light heavyweights. Um, all provide different things. I think it's fair to say Boatsy is obviously the most accomplished from an amateur perspective. Um, Callum Johnson is just a huge puncher. One of the biggest pound-for-pound punches uh, in world boxing at the moment. And... Um, and the yard, of course, has been at a world level and, uh, as I said, did himself sort of no harm in terms of profile, etc. And so, overall, very good fighter. So, I think we're lucky in the sense that we've got three really good Brits at 175. But, obviously, at the moment, it's all uh, in Russia and Ukraine, kind of, uh, who's controlling it uh, at the top. So, it's an interesting one. Um, as I said, I think the Serbitev's a man. Um, but, like you said, We've got Callum Johnson who goes under the radar and of course we've got Boatsy in the yard. So I think this is a division where the Brits, it might take a few years, but I think the Brits might reach the top eventually. 
Yeah, like I say, Callum Johnson, you know, he could go in with any of those guys and it wouldn't surprise you if he were to pull it off. I'd love to see him fight Kovalev right now, actually. That's a fight I like. But, um, yeah, you know, the the McCorkin fight is supposed to happen. I remember interviewing Callum a few weeks ago. I think it was maybe the week before all this whole lockdown came came around. And uh, we were talking about the McCorkin fight. And it was me who actually said to him, are you aware that McCorkin obviously beat Baturbiev a, a couple times in the amateurs? He had no idea. He didn't seem scared at all, though. That's that's just Callum. But, um, no, you know, a, a tremendous fight. I actually put a poll on our on our Twitter page the other day uh, asking if, if that fight were to happen, the all-British matchroom show down at Light Heavy, Callum Johnson and Joshua Boatsy, who would you favour? And most people went with Boatsy, surprisingly enough, in my eyes anyway. But um, leaving 175, going down to super middle, and another thing actually, just before we move from from Light Heavyweight, I'm really um, interested to to see what Gilberto Ramirez does as well, obviously moving up from um, from super middle up to light heavy, 40 and 0 is the record, but um, really yet to make his mark in that division. For some reason, he didn't end up doing that WBO rule where he goes straight into the mandatory position. I don't believe so. Uh, bit tricky with him, but um, like I say, at, at 168 super middleweight, um, the fight for me there is a tough one really because I struggle to know where Canelo fits into all of this. You know, is is he a where do you put him really? I mean, it's, he, he could be anywhere from from middle up to light heavy now, you know? I don't think he's going to make middleweight. I, I genuinely don't because of that fight against Kovalev. Um, I think his division now is 68. Mm. Um, uh, that's what I believe. Um, and I think there's some tough fights for him. I, I genuinely do. Uh, the likes of Billy Saunders, Caleb Plant. We've seen Canelo struggle against that kind of slick boxer style before. Of course, notably against Lara, um, Trout gave him a good fight. Obviously, we know what happened with Floyd Mayweather. Um, I think Billy Joe and Caleb Plant could be his toughest uh, assignments in that division. Obviously, you've got like, the big guys as well, like uh, Danny Jacobs, Callum Smith. Um, I know Jacobs is trying to get that rematch. Canelo's got a lot of fights left on his, uh, his own contract, so that might be another one that comes about. Um, obviously, Benavidez as well is, is an absolute beast uh, in that division. So I think that's tricky because the three tall guys um, are all going to provide some sort of challenge in terms of their in their height and size and their strength. And as I said, Billy and Caleb Plant, really slick fighters, um, going to cause problems for anyone. Having said that, though, obviously, <laughs> Canelo didn't seem to struggle too much um, at 75 against a huge guy against Kovalev, kind of took his this sting out and then attack the body. So maybe, so maybe Canelo's probably got a better chance against the bigger guys where he can uh, attack the body and work sort of and break down them fighters. I think, I think as I said at the start, Billy Joe and Caleb Plant are the two fights for me uh, that I want to see Canelo in because uh, I think there is the trickiest uh, assignments on paper. Yeah, again, um, you know, Canelo pretty much calls the shots, so any fight with him is a big fight and probably is the biggest fight that can be made. But him aside, I mean, like I said, there's some real fun fights that can be made. You mentioned most of the guys there, Saunders and Smith, Benavidez, um, obviously Daniel Jacobs is up there now at 168, Caleb Plant, um, you know, John Ryder will fight any of the above. You know, there's there's a lot of great fights that can be made there, to be completely honest with you. Um, obviously, again, on the British scene, you've got Zach Parker coming through, a guy that I think has got an incredibly, incredibly bright future. Um, so, yeah, lots and lots of good fights that can be made there. One of the best divisions, actually, in boxing for me, 168. Going down to 160, um, you've got Gennady Golovkin there, even though, again, it seems like he's going to follow Canelo um, wherever that wherever that will go. So so again, they're they're still talking about doing this third fight, Omar, on the zone. They're talking about it. I think um, for later this year, they're they're trying to do, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a Canelo fight in September against maybe a Plant, maybe a Saunders, and and one or one or two other guys. I think might have been Benavidez. And then after that fight's out the way, they're talking about a December showdown with Golovkin. Like I say, if I'm not mistaken. Um, where would that where would that then take place, do you think? Because, I mean, I know you're probably not really going to know the answer to this, but if he were to beat one of those guys that we mentioned there, then he holds a belt at 168. Do you think Golovkin would follow him up there? Or does Canelo come back down to 160, which I'm in agreement with you, really. Can he make it after making 175? 
I don't see a situation where Canelo will come down to 160 for Golovkin, <laughs> even in the first two fights. And any Canelo fight, um, he will always try and dictate the terms. And he, he normally gets his way because he's the, the biggest uh, money fight in boxing. So I see Golovkin uh, moving up to 68 for that fight. I think it will happen. Um, listen, it's still a huge fight because it's two of the biggest names in, in world boxing still. So you can kind of criticise it all you want now, but once it comes to fight week, we'll all be amped for it. Um, do I really want to see it, though? Probably not. Um, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing it, but there's a, there's a whole load of other fights that I'd like to see Canelo in above uh, a Triple G trilogy because going off that Derevinchenko fight, you can just see it's not the same Golovkin and... Obviously, a lot of people thought, including myself, Golovkin won the first fight. And then the second fight, you can see he kind of slowed down. Still a close fight. Um, but I think because Golovkin's past the peak of his powers, um, I wouldn't like to see that because I think Canelo goes in there as a huge favourite. And then when you look back at the record, it will say draw and two Canelo wins. And that doesn't really justify, I think, uh, sort of the, the rivalry between Canelo and Golovkin because... Look at it on paper, obviously, it looked like Canelo completely dominated him, but that wouldn't be a fair reflection. So, for the hype and stuff, and the, you know, the, the fight week, etc., it'll probably be great, but it, it's a fight that I, I wouldn't really want to see. I'd rather see, as I said, Canelo in a, in a lot of other fights. Yeah. Um, I mean, if if that fight again were to not take place, which it probably will, and, and I am in agreement, I'm not too keen about the third Golovkin fight. Um, it seems like Canelo's getting better, you know, in, in all the time, really. He's getting better all the time. And as you say, Golovkin seems to be on the slide. But if Golovkin were to stay at 160 and still obviously, um, you know, be considered in many people's eyes as, as, as the king, really, at that weight with the IBF world title, there are some brilliant fights that I'd love to see him in. And those fights would be against Jamal Charlo. Those, those fights would be against Demetrius Andrade. Um, you know, Liam Williams, another guy I'd love to see him and Andrade. I know he wants that fight. He'll box any of those guys there. And also, um, I know you did an interview with Roy Jones Jr. the other week. You know, he's now training uh, Chris Eubank Jr. Chris Eubank Jr. It's a frustrating one, really, with him because you know he's had a he's had a he's had a very odd career. If you if you if you really think about it, you know he's been with various different promoters and stuff like that. He's been with. I remember when he was with Hennessy at the beginning. I think it was I think it was Hennessy he made his debut with and all that. And then obviously with Frank and Eddie and the rest of it. And um, you know we thought we'd see a rematch with Billy Joe that never ended up happening. We thought we'd see the Golovkin fight that never ended up happening. And now he's decided to kind of you know, up and go to the States. He's got a contract with Al Heyman. We've seen him um, flung in a little bit, actually, when he when he was uh, in that fight last time out against... Um, the name slipped me there, who might help me out. Korobov. Korobov there we go. Korobov. So, obviously, that was set yeah. up to be a good fight, and it wasn't his fault the way it ended. We didn't really get to see it play out, but he's talking about all these guys, you know. Um, he's talking about Charlo, which is a fight... I salivate over. That's an incredible, incredible step up. I'd love to see that. Um, again, you know, he he gives all these guys trouble as well. I, I want to see the big fights for him. I feel like it, it is kind of now or never for Chris Eubank Jr. Um, I'm right, though. I feel, Uma, let me know if you disagree, but he's had a bit of a strange career kind of thing. Very strange career. Um, I'll firstly just say I agree with you. I think if Charlo can't land that mega fight against Golovkin uh, or even a fight with Demetrius Andrade, I think Eubank Jr. and Charlo makes perfect sense. They're both from Al Haven, so I don't see why that fight can't be made. Um, they're both interesting characters. I'm sure the build-up to that fight would be would be good as well from that perspective. So, And Eubank, yeah, since he's done this deal with Al Haven and moved to BBC, he hasn't really had that, that big fight yet over there, so Charlo would be that guy. Yeah, in terms of Chris Eubank Jr., Obviously, um, if I remember correctly, against Billy Joe Saunders, it was on paper 50-50. A lot of people were backing Eubank in that one as well because it's just of his name. Um, and then, yeah, he's, a, he's had a strange career. You're right. I mean, the mega fights that he's, he's been in with Billy Joe and, and George Groves uh, hasn't gone his way. But obviously, he got his uh, win over James to go an arch rival. Obviously, James was to the back end of his career in that one. And 
retired afterwards. Um, and then a, and then weird, you know, uh, PBC debut. Well, American PBC debut with Korobov um, ended in two rounds because uh, of his broken shoulder. So I, I don't think we've seen the best of Eubank Jr. Uh, yet. Um, obviously, when he's been in, in with the likes of Nick Blackwell and Yildrim and Quinlan and uh, Arthur Abraham, even people like that, we you know he's done very well against you say European to world class level guys. But when he's been at the elite uh, end of the sport, it just hasn't happened for him yet. Um, let's see if that fight with Charlo happens, and you know if he can beat Charlo, then he's right back in the mix. Um, obviously, um, for for a Golovkin fight or even a Canelo fight, if he can beat Charlo, who knows? Um, to go up to sixty eight and fight Canelo possibly. Yeah, like I say, um, I feel like it is now or never for Chris Eubank Jr. I feel like the time is now if he is to win a world title. It would be a great shame if he was to, to, you know, to almost be on the slide himself and then, you know, he never achieves one because I feel like he is good enough. And there's been there's been champions, um, you know, in and around the weight, really, that you'd have picked him against every day of the week. Um, if we go down to 154, I think we're going to... This this will probably be the last one we we, we discuss because we've we've been recording for a little while now. Um, th- this will be the last weight category we discuss. Perhaps we'll we'll do welterweight and downwards some other week during this pandemic, Umar. But um, one fifty four, the main man for me is Jamel Charlo, obviously, especially coming back now and avenging his his sole defeat to Tony Harrison, which people forget was a very close fight. To come back and stop him in the second one was very impressive for me. Um, sometimes though, when you identify a guy as the top guy, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's involved in your favourite fights to be made because he can be head, heads and sh- oh, heads and shoulders above the rest of the guys um, underneath him. And for me, he kind of is that. Um, there are still some fun fights though to be made, but I want to concentrate on Kell Brook. Kell Brook is a guy that um, you know I'm a huge fan of. I want the best for Kell Brook. I want I want to see him win a world title at 154. Um, but for me, though, he, he's a little bit on the slide. Is there any of the champions that you'd favour him against? I know I'm, I might be putting you in a bit of a difficult situation there, but um, how do you see his future, really, at 154, Kell? Well, to be honest, I don't think his next fight will be at 54 because there's these um, rumours going on the line of Spence and Danny Garcia fighting, which leaves Terence Scrawford with a fight. And we know Bob Arum has welcomed um, the opportunity for, for that fight to happen between Terence Scrawford and Kel Brooks. He, he's even said that Terence might come to the UK. This was kind of at the start of lockdown. Uh, whether that happens now, obviously, is a different scenario because uh, you wouldn't be doing a fight in the UK without any fans. Um, but maybe towards the back end of the year, if, if we do get fans, then maybe Crawford Brook will happen here. Um, if not in the States. So I don't actually see Brooks' next fight um, being at 54. But let's say the Crawford fight doesn't happen for the purpose of your question. Um, there's the guys like Texera, um, Rosario, all the, the champs. Um, you'd, you'd have to give Kelbrook a, a good shot in that. I mean, these are guys that I haven't really seen much of. Um, obviously, quite recent world champions. Um, and... Yeah, you, you'd you'd give Brook a good shout in there because it, it's not like he's fighting, you know, champions who have been defending titles uh, for ages and have been at the top of the sport um, for a long time. Um, so you'd give Brook uh, a good shot, I think, against them, especially um, compared to a, to a fight with Terence Crawford at 47. We know it's going to be incredibly hard for Brook to make 47. And we're talking about Terence Crawford as one of the best fighters in the world. So... Maybe for if you want to, you know, win another world title, it's to look at the Tex series and Rosaros of the world at 54, where you're a bit more comfortable. But the money involved in the Crawford fight um, might sway into that. Yeah. Yeah, interesting to see his future pan out. But like I say, still some great fights to be made at 154. Obviously, you've, you've still got the likes of Jarrett Hurd, who, um, you know, only only has that one loss to J-Rock. He can certainly come back from that. He seemed like he outgrew the division a little bit. But, um, you know, 
we, we may see him box there a couple more times. I, I think we will. Very big guy. Obviously, you've got the likes of Argentina's Brian Castano. He's another guy certainly to keep an eye on. Um, a guy that holds a, a a good couple wins in the amateurs. Also, um, you know, he's got that one minor blemish, a draw, a split draw to Erislandi Lara. He's a real problem. Um, I think he beat Errol Spence in the amateurs as well. So. Uh, that that was a tough thing to do because Errol Spence was a great amateur. But yeah, there's there's a lot of guys. Even Sergio Garcia, the guy that um, we were there, Umar, when he when he beat um, Ted Cheeseman at, at the cop was it the copper box that one? I think yeah, I think it was, wasn't it? Oh two, I want to say might have been. Uh, yes. Okay. February 02. Well, yeah. Fe- yeah, the first it was like the first guy show it was in February, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that was. Um, that was hard, you know. That was that was a that was a bad um, a, a bad a bad loss for Cheeseman. But yeah, I want to see Garcia do something because he's had a couple kind of um, you know treading water type fights since then. He hasn't really pushed on. But yeah, some great fights to be made. But like I say, that's it. We've gone down from heavy right down to one fifty four. We've discussed quite a lot of fights there over the twenty five or twenty six minutes we've been recording. Um, once again, it's it's only going to be one guest on this week's podcast, so I'll bring him in in just a minute. But before that, Umar, I just want to thank you once again. Like I say, you've been on the show a couple times before. I think once or twice before. The listeners, um, one of the listeners in particular, um, messaged me a few weeks ago and said that I need to get you back on. So uh, I, I, I did just that during this pandemic, and thank you, like I say, for taking part once again. Hopefully, we can do this again real soon, and uh, maybe before the the pandemic is over, to to go down from welterweight and right down to uh, to to minimum. <laughs> Definitely, Joey. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we'll do uh, next time you get me on. We'll go from uh, well uh, right down to minimum. I'm not sure how much insight I can give you at minimum weight, but I'll do my best. Uh, But yeah, everyone listening, stay safe, obviously, uh, and keep yourself well as well, Joe. Excellent. Thank you very much, Umar. Like I say, just before we, we wrap up all the talking, the final thing to do is to welcome our sole guest on this week's podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the reigning WBA super flyweight world champion. It is, of course, Mr. Andrew Maloney. Andrew, welcome to the show, my man. Hey, thanks for having us, Jerry. No problem. How you going, mate? All good, my friend. All good. So, Andrew, first things first. Obviously, you're one half of the Maloney twins. You've got you and your brother, your brother Jason. Um, the first real question: What's it like to have a twin brother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, well, to be honest, I don't, I don't know any different. But, um, but definitely, I think in uh, professional boxing, it definitely has its advantages. Um, I mean, especially at the moment, while we've been in lockdown, I've been lucky that I've got a twin brother, and there's probably a lot of people out there who who don't have, you know, a sparring partner or a trading partner at the moment, and I'm lucky enough that I've got a twin brother who's also a professional boxer, and we go everywhere together, and I've always got a sparring partner handy. (laughs) And, you know, I'd like to think (laughs) that the boxing journey began together, but tell us about it. How did you both, you know, get into boxing in the very beginning, Andrew? Yeah, that's right. Well, being twin brothers, we've we've always been extremely competitive. We, you know, in general, but also especially against each other. Um, so growing up, we used to compete everything we did, and for some reason, Santa Claus thought it'd be a good idea to give a, a couple of ten-year-old boys a pair of boxing gloves each uh, for Christmas one year, and we used to put them on in the living room and just beat the crap out of each other for about an hour straight and um that's sort of what started the whole love for boxing um and then when we were about 13 years old our dream was to to play Australian rules football professionally um and that's all we wanted to do growing up so when we were about 13 we went down to the local boxing gym just for a bit of extra fitness for our to help our football and then um we did it for about three years before we had our first fight and yeah we got to about 16 years old and a few of the older guys down at the club said you guys are really good you should look at starting to compete in the amateurs and and start fighting so we said yeah all right we'll we'll give it a go um it was the footy season was on its break at that time so we we entered the, the local competition and started fighting and um it turns out those those older blokes were lying to us because I lost my first seven fights in a row. So they 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 were wrong about that one. I wasn't good, but um, 
I, that those losses sort of made me just want it even more and made me more hungry. And I realized that if I wanted to continue boxing, I need to focus on that 100%. So I stopped playing football and just concentrated on boxing and started training, you know, six, seven days a week. And then the results really started to turn around and I made the Australian team and went to world championships and Commonwealth Games. And here you have it, 16, 17 years later, um, professional and world champion. (laughs) And, you know, obviously when you started out, was one of you more or less keen than the other brother or were you immediately both as keen as each other to to give boxing a real go you know um we're probably both as keen as each other but it was it was jason's idea to to go down to the boxing gym and 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 start training for fitness so it was probably his idea Mm. um so we myself and jason and our older brother and even a couple of our mates all went down at the time and we um our mates sort of lost interest and the older brother the same it wasn't really for him but jason and i just just fell in love with the sport and just kept going and yeah we uh we got hooked and obviously you mentioned that you you'd lost your first seven bouts in a row initially who had more talent i'm guessing it must have been jason yeah yeah jason that would have been more talented at the start i'd say he, he won his i think he lost his first three and then he had a win so he he was uh, ahead of me um, tried to show me how it was done, but it took me a while to to pick it up. And uh, but yeah, as I said, as once we started training full time and and really committed to boxing, the results definitely started to change. And I think I didn't lose a, a fight in Australia for like another five years or so after that. Yeah, excellent stuff. And like I say, you mentioned as well. You know, you went to the Commonwealth Games in 2014. You picked up a gold medal there. Um, that's got to be your your best memory as an amateur, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I went to the Commonwealth Games in 2010 as well. Jason and I both went together that year, and no one on the whole team won a medal that year. Um, so we went home really disappointed, and I, I then set my sights on the Olympic Games, which were in 2012, which I I felt I should have been selected, but I wasn't. Um, so then I, I set my sights on the Commonwealth Games again in 2014, and, and this time I went, when I was going there, I, I really had set in my head that I wasn't going home without a medal this time, and I really trained extremely hard for that one and and made all the sacrifices needed, and and I sort of matured and developed as a as a boxer in those four years, and I was lucky enough to to walk away with a gold medal at, at that tournament, and and that was the perfect em- ending for me for my for my amateur career. And I knew as soon as I got home, I was going to turn professional. And again, in the amateurs, you know, you box you box some big names along the way. Obviously, the likes of Rabisi Ramirez, an eventual gold medalist, and Paddy Barnes, who we know really well over here. Um, did you box any other fairly big names in the amateurs, Andrew? Um, trying to think of some of the names. Like a lot of the really good amateurs aren't really that well known. A lot of them, you know, don't even end up turning professional, but. I boxed quite a few times over in Cuba and Russia and things like that against some some great fighters, um, but no, probably no names I can really think of. But I went to a lot of different tournaments. Went to three world championships as well: two thousand and nine, two thousand and eleven, and two thousand and thirteen as well. So I boxed a lot overseas and and sparred and fought a, a lot of great fighters. Yeah. And of course, your pro journey began on October 31st, 2014. You boxed on a Billy Dib undercard. Uh, Billy Dib's a good friend of the show, by the way, a, a top a top guy. Um, you picked up a stoppage win inside three rounds that night. Do you remember much of your debut, Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. I remember it really clear. It was uh, something I looked forward to for, for so many years. Um, just the whole atmosphere of professional boxing compared to amateur boxing. It's just a, a real buzz and... Yeah, I was pumped that night and, and managed to stop my opponent in yeah the third round with a, a good body shot. And, yeah, I just loved it. As soon as you lace up those small gloves, it's such a difference compared to the amateurs. And, yeah, when you hit people, you, you hurt them and it's, it's a good feeling. <laughs> 
And obviously, you know, you can progress quite quickly through the ranks, really. You know, picking up the WBA Oceana bantamweight title in just your sick fight. You defended the belt three times before then moving down to super flyweight and vacating the title, which then allowed your brother to box for it and win it. Um, how did that decision come about? Did you always want to be a super flyweight rather than a bantamweight? Or did Jason have quite a, an influence on that decision? <laughs> no, it wasn't Jason that had the influence. It was... We, um, I suppose we, in that time frame, we, we changed trainers. We, we started training with our, our new trainer, Angelo Hyder and, and Tony Nobbs. And we, we moved state to, to train with those two guys and moved away from our family and friends. And I suppose we just took things up to a whole new level and everything became more professional. And we realized throughout the different style of training we were doing and, during the longer rounds in training and obviously in fights that we were making the weight too easily and, and there was a chance we could move down in weight and we um, yeah decided to give it a go and uh, I think it was a great decision. I'm I'm perfect at band and weight now and Jason's a, a good size, oh, sorry, at super flyweight and Jason's a good size band and weight. So I think it was a really good move. And of course, you're both listed as the exact same height. Are you both exactly the same height or is one of you just a fraction taller than the other? No, nah, no, nah, Jason's actually a little bit taller than me. He's probably got about three centimetres on me. Um, and I think that's down due, I say it comes down to the 2010 Commonwealth Games, which it was actually that year that they changed the weights. Um, so the amateur weight categories used to be 51 kilos and 54. Um, and they changed it to 49 and 52. Uh, and so that me and Jason could both go to the Commonwealth Games, I made the decision that I'd move down to 49 kilos, and and he could so he could go at 52. And during that year or two of making that weight ki- uh, weight limit of 49 kilos, I, I barely ate a thing. That <laughs> I was really draining myself to make that weight, and I reckon that's what made Jason have that growth spurt and I missed out on it. So I blame him for for me being shorter. <laughs> So, so like I say, you moved down to Superfly and immediately you boxed for the WBA Oceana title at that weight. Of course, you won the fight in the fourth round, but you were down yourself in round three that night. Um, tell us about that fight there, Andrew. That was against Raymond Tabagon, is that is that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, I believe so. So he's a, a wild Filipino, um, throws some really wild punches and I actually have had him over for sparring in Australia since since that fight. He's a really good guy, Raymond, and he um yeah he was really wild and I got a bit careless and it was sort of half a knockdown and half he clotheslined me. He was that wild that he just knocked me straight over. Um, but I wasn't hurt, but it definitely made me realise that he was dangerous and to show him a bit more respect and. It was a great fight to watch because I got up the next round, obviously got up, um, got through that round, and then the next round I ended up stopping him myself. So it was, a, it was a great fight for the fans to watch. And then, of course, after that fight, you defend your belt successfully four times, including that fourth win there um, over Luis Concepcion, a guy we, we know well over here because, of course, he's got history with Cal Yafai. Um, was that Concepcion win probably the best win of your career at that time, on paper especially? Yeah, definitely, definitely at that time and and possibly of my career so far. I mean, it wasn't my hardest fight, I wouldn't say, but um, Conception's, you know, record in the history and what he's achieved in the sport, it definitely is my biggest win. He was he's a two or two time world champion or even three time. He's had a couple of interim belts in there as well and he's a great fighter, so Obviously knew that he was world champion. I think it was 18 months before that fight is when your fight took the belt off Conception. Um, so I really just wanted to, to show what level I was at and show that I was ready to fight for a world title. And um, yeah, I got I went into that fight, we, you know, knowing how dangerous Conception was, and I think it really bringing out the best in me. You know, I put on a really good performance that night and and ended up stopping him in the in the last round of the fight, which. Yeah, it was a great victory. 
Yeah, it really was. That's a, that's an excellent win there. And then, of course, after that is where you box in a world title eliminator against Miguel Gonzalez. And for me, that win against him, you know, to actually become the first man to stop him, that win was was kind of the start for me of the alarm bells ringing through that division. You know, Andrew Maloney's a dangerous guy. Um, you know, that that's what it did to me anyway. That that for me, that win there signaled that you know you're you're a serious threat to all the top guys. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, the the fact that I had to travel over to Chile and and fight him in his own backyard was was also a, you know a big thing and definitely you know a disadvantage going to someone else's backyard. So we travelled over there and we couldn't put on the fight here in Australia, but we wanted obviously that eliminator to to be mandatory for the world title. So we backed ourselves and, and went over to Chile and and um. They 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 tried everything they could to rip me off in that fight. I think they even had me down on the scorecards at the end of the fight, which is was crazy. I felt I won pretty much every round. I I slipped over in one of the rounds, and there wasn't even a punch thrown, but they called it a knockdown. So when that happened, I the alarm bells went off, and I knew that they were going to do everything they could to to not let me win. So I sort of changed tactics and just really started to to hurt him to the body, and then. By doing that, he then dropped his hands and I ended up with a really good knockout win in, in the eighth round. And, yeah, I was, that, I was ecstatic with that victory. Um, I was like, it was, it's quite funny because during the fight, I was that nervous knowing that they were about to rip me off that I was almost you know, starting to panic, but but still obviously staying composed and, and trying to win the fight. And I was just so relieved after I knocked him out that, I knew there was nothing they could do to stop me from, from getting my hand raised and become mandatory for the world championship. Yeah, and of course, that is what happened. After that, you boxed Selamani Bangaza and got rid of him in two rounds in what was one of the strangest ends, actually, to a fight I've seen <laughs> in recent times. Um, just, for, just for anyone that may be listening to me that don't know what happened, it's like... I mean, he didn't want to fight. At one point, uh, you know, he, he put his arms up in the air in the middle of the action. And to be fair, you didn't really have to, Andrew, but you kind of, you know, you laid off him a little bit. You stopped hitting him. And, you know, the referee jumped in and asked him if he wants to continue, to which he said no. And then the referee said, again, do you want to fight or not? And then he basically changed his mind and said, yeah. And then after, you know, being forced into retreat mode pretty much straight away when action resumed, uh, you know, he did the same thing, but this time the gum shield got spat out, and that was the end of it. Um, yeah, that's a weird, a weird and frustrating way, I guess, to uh, to end the fight there, Andrew. Like I say, strange one. Yeah, that was a really disappointing fight. That one, the I was originally supposed to fight a tough Mexican opponent, um, uh, Ruben Montoya, I think his name is, um, and it was really looking forward to that fight, and it was. Um, going to be shown live on ESPN plus over in America. And I was really looking forward to putting on a, you know, a good show and, and showing the American fans what I can do. And unfortunately due to visa, he got knocked back for a visa. I think it was either him or someone in his team had a criminal history and, and couldn't get led into Australia. So it was only about two weeks before the fight. We, we had to search for a new opponent, so which is always going to be hard to get someone of a, of a high level. So the best opponent we could get was Salamani. Um, he was coming from Tanzania. So I actually trained with a, a fellow Tanzanian boxer, Bruno Tarimo, and he's the, one of the hungriest boxers I've ever seen. So I was expecting the same thing from Salamani to come over and be really hungry and, and come to win. But it was the total opposite. He came over here and literally as soon as, I probably threw my first punch. I could see in his eyes that he didn't want to be there anymore. And unfortunately for myself fighting on TV and for the crowd and everyone that had come to watch me fight, it was a waste of time really. He just spat his mouth gut out and said, no, I I don't want to do this anymore. So it was a real disappointment, especially after putting in such a hard training camp. But that's the way things go. And fortunately, I got a, a good opportunity in my next fight. Yeah, um, strangely enough, I think he's now 
moved down to, to, to minimum weight, which is just incredible. But anyway, so that's him. Um, y- your last fight, Andrew, was, was against Elton Dari for the interim WBA world title back in November now. Obviously, the fight ended after eight rounds when the doctor stopped it in the corner due to the cut that Dari had sustained. Um, talk us through that fight. I remember seeing highlights of it, and to his credit, he landed a peach of an uppercut in that fight that you took as well. Yeah, it was um, probably not my best performance, to be honest. But, um, yeah, I had the opportunity to fight for the interim title after it was a, it was a weird situation. Your fire was supposed to fight um, Estrada a week or two after that fight for and unify the belts, which would have made one of those guys super champion and, and I would have fought for the regular title. But our fight being scheduled before then meant it was going to be for the interim title and then be elevated. Um, but that, that fight ended up happening, ended up fighting Roman Gonzalez. But anyway, we got the opportunity to fight for the interim belt, so we, we took that and, and uh, the highest rated guy that accepted the fight was De Harry. So he came over to Australia and he hadn't lost in 10 years. So he's, he's a very good fighter and, and trains out of Gleason's gym in New York. And he came over and and yeah, he put on a you know, gave me a hard fight and you're right, he caught me with a with a really good uppercut which I completely didn't see you know, and um well basically knocked me down. I think my knee I can't tell if my knee did touch the canvas or not, but I managed to stay on my feet and survive that round and then get back to doing what I what I was doing before that and I controlled the fight other than that, that round where he knocked me down and his eye was completely shut. And um, after eight rounds com- completed, the doctor had looked at his eye quite a few times and it was just getting worse and worse and to a point where he really couldn't see any punches coming in the eighth round and was starting to take a fair bit of punishment. So the, the, the referee and the doctor decided to stop the fight and I was crowned, crowned interim world champion um, to then which the WBA allowed uh, your fight to defend his belt against Roman Gonzalez even though my mandatory was due, they obviously considered um, Rum Gonzalez's history and allowed that fight to go through, which I understand. He's a, he's a legend of the sport. So they let uh, Yafai defend his belt against Chocolatito, and Chocolatito obviously ended up winning and became the super champion, and I was elevated to, to regular champion. Yeah, yeah, of course. And that, that, took, that happened sometime in March, was it, I believe? Yeah, around then, I believe I'm not 100% sure of the, the date at all. Actually, no, it was the 3rd of March because it was uh, my wedding anniversary, so I'll remember that's the day that I officially was crowned world champion. Oh, wow, excellent, excellent. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah, you know, that that's obviously that, that was obviously the situation, what took place there, and you were due to make your first defence against Israel Gonzalez on April 17th. It was set to be your US debut, and, you know, it was going to be taking place in Oklahoma, but obviously the show was cancelled due to the coronavirus. However, the latest news is that you have managed to get yourself out to the States just this week. This is excellent stuff. Um, what can you tell us about the current situation? Yeah, that's right. I was due to defend my title and headline a, a big show in Oklahoma against Israel Gonzalez. And then two days before we're actually about to fly out to America after doing a really good training camp, two days before we're about to fly out, we got news that all shows had then been cancelled going forward um, due to the coronavirus. So that was heartbreaking. But um, while I was already extremely fit, we decided to you know, to not let this the, the lockdown affect us and, and stayed in the gym every day and, and continued to train hard and tried to use that time to, to really improve as much as I could. Um, I knew that a lot of boxers would have been using that time as a bit of a holiday and, and slacking off, so I wanted to get an edge and, and really use that time to develop as much as I could. And fortunately en- enough, we, we got word that um, my manager had been talking with our promoter, Top Prank, and we got word that they were looking – to start doing shows in, around mid June behind closed doors with no audience. So my manager worked really hard to to try and find a way for us to get over here to America, and we we're lucky enough that he was able to get us an exemption through the Australian government and the US to allow us to travel um, at three o'clock, and said, "Yep, yeah, we've got approved. Pack your bags. We're going to leave tomorrow morning." So we, we madly rushed and 
packed our bags and and flew out to America on the Friday morning and yeah arrived here a few days ago and now we're just getting getting used to and acclimatizing and continuing to train and meeting with top rank and discussing when we're going to get in the ring and it's it's looking like they're going to get us a fight towards mid to late June um haven't quite yet got a, an opponent locked in um but they have thrown a few names up which are all really exciting fights that I'm I'm looking forward to so I'm hoping in the next day or two we'll have an opponent and a date confirmed but we're training hard at the moment and they tested us yesterday the corona test and we we passed that we've got you know corona free so they're allowing us to now use the top rank gym to continue our training camp and get ready to fight in a few weeks time and um obviously you, you know undertaking this this coronavirus thing was it painful to, to take the test no so it wasn't actually because i'd seen people taking the test where they shove it right down your nose yeah. to touch your throat which looked horrible i wasn't really looking forward to that but they um they've since changed the way they're doing the test and they just basically shove it down your mouth um and do a bit of a swab of your throat which it's a little bit uncomfortable but yeah nowhere near as bad as going down your nose i would say <laughs> no, it's great <laughs> news though to hear that you're you know you're using their facilities now and you know we're gonna hopefully get some news in the coming days so we'll certainly be looking out for that um yeah the the fight with israel gonzalez though is that one that you are, are hoping to get rescheduled for sometime in the future or is that probably not going to happen now um, yeah, I mean it's 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 a good fight. He's he's a good fighter. Um, some of the names have thrown up so far are also really exciting fights. Um, so if that fight happens, it happens. But um, if not, I'm just looking forward to continuing to defend my belt against good, well-known fighters and establish my name on the you know the world boxing scene and and develop as a fighter and, and you know start to to build a, a big fan base and show them what I can do. Um, and then. Chocolatito, obviously, being the WBA super champion, is definitely a fight that I, I look forward to having in the future, hopefully not too far away. Yeah, excellent stuff. Like I say, the way you've been moved, I think it's excellent. The way the way you've been moved, I think you've had the right fights at the right time, and really, um, you know, a lot of them are learning fights and stuff like that. I feel like this is going to be your time. I want to ask you a couple of questions about Jason. Obviously, you know, we've seen him in the World Boxing Super Series. It, in In hindsight, was a little bit, too soon i guess perhaps some people would say but you know he lost to a fantastic fighter in emmanuel rodriguez i know a lot of people think because he got blown away by by inue that he's no good he's an exceptional fighter how is jason doing and what's next for him andrew yeah jason's doing really well um and yeah you're right i think that we just sort of hadn't been with our new trainer long when jason entered this super series but um it was probably maybe six months to a year too early for him for for that sort of level of competition. But, you know, it was an opportunity that was too good to, to pass up, obviously. So he, um you know, had a crack and and put on a great performance. As anyone who's seen the fight, it was, it was an exceptional fight. And, you know, a fight that really could have gone either way. Um, as the scorecard showed, it was a split decision and uh, two judges gave it one round to Rodriguez and one game. Round, one judge gave one round to, to Jason, so as close a fight as you can get for a world title, and you're right, against a really good fighter, and you're right in saying that Rodriguez probably now doesn't get you know, the credit he deserves because of that Anui loss, but he just got caught in that fight, and Anui's obviously you know, a very powerful puncher, so he got unlucky in that fight, but he, he definitely is a, a really good fighter. And I'm, Jason learned a lot from that fight and has developed since then into a much, much better boxer. So I'm sure when Jason gets the opportunity to fight for a world title again, he will he will win that title this time and have his hand raised. And we're hoping that, that he might get that opportunity pretty soon. He um, he was scheduled to fight Joshua Greer in a basically an unofficial eliminator. Jason's number two in the WBO and Greer's number one. So... They were going to fight each other before the whole coronavirus thing put a stop to that. And that is still a fight that may possibly happen while we're over here in America. Um, if not, then there is also a potential that Jason may fight Casimiro for the WBO belt. I know he's over here as well. So we're just waiting to find out what's next for Jason. But as I said, he's developed so much over the last year or two. And I'm really confident that he'll become world champion in the next six months or so. 
Yeah, I'm pleased to hear that. And obviously, you mentioned when you were younger, you'd put the gloves on, you'd 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 hit each other for upwards of an hour. Um, nowadays, when you spar each other, um, do you would you see, do you guys go a hundred percent with each other? Yeah, you know, we we do. We, it's really good sparring against each other. Actually, we we used to be just stupid and just not not want to let the other person get an upper hand. So we'd we'd end up in a full blown brawl and just end up wrestling each other on the floor and trying to take the gloves off and all kinds of stupid stuff. But but these days we're a bit more mature and we realise that it's not us that we're competing against anymore. It's it's everyone else. So we we try and help each other as much as we can these days and. Yeah, our sparring is really good against each other. We we fight at a really high work rate, and because we know each other so well, it forces us to try and adjust a lot during the rounds, and and you know faint a lot and, and use a, set a lot of traps to try and catch the other person. So it's it's actually really good us sparring each other these days. And I want to I want this is a bit of a tough question I'm going to throw at you now, Andrew. Um, if you was to ask this question to the Klitschko brothers, if you was to say to the Klitschko brothers, who's the more talented? Vitali would say Vladimir is. Vladimir would say Vitali is. There's other brothers in boxing that they 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 say no, I'm actually more talented than my brother. <laughs> not not so modest. <laughs> um, who's the more talented? You said that he was initially when you started out and you lost a bunch of fights in a row. Who's the more talented now, in your honest opinion? <laughs> Mm, that's a tough one. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd, I would say we have differences, and there's some things that he's better at than than I am, definitely. And I think there's some things that that I'm better at. We 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 have, even though from an outsider's point of view, they probably think we box similar. We there's a lot of differences as well, which our coach, you know, has picked up on a, a lot. And yeah, I would say there's there's definitely things that he's definitely better at me at but there's probably a few things that i'm maybe better than him at so yeah it's 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 very even okay and just coming down to the final couple questions now andrew um i'm going to put you on the spot a tiny bit here but this is a question we ask to everybody that we speak to from overseas um who comes to mind when i ask who's your favorite uk fighter of any era it can be a guy that retired a hundred years ago if you like any era favorite uk fighter andrew Oh, tough one. Um, oh, that's tough. Visual, like for entertainment, I've got to say Naz, Prince Nassim. Definitely. But, um, yeah, I'll probably go with Prince Nassim. But there's been so many good UK fighters. Joe, Joe Calzaghi is also an unbelievable fighter. Uh, I'll go with those two. Yeah, that's probably the two most popular answers anyway, Andrew. So uh, definitely <laughs> right in saying that. And uh, just finally, before we let you go, if you've got any closing words to our listeners, if there's anything you want to say just to sign out with, then the floor is yours, my friend. No, just everyone stay safe and uh, do the right thing during this coronavirus thing so we can get through it as soon as possible and get the world back to normality. Um, obviously, there hasn't been any live sport for a while, so... I'm really looking forward to get back in the ring and I hope you're all excited to watch me fight soon and, and tune in wherever you can to watch me fight. And uh, I really appreciate your support. Absolutely. And where can people follow you also on social media, Andrew, if they're not already following? Um, at Andrew Maloney. Maloney, Maloney spelled M-O-L-O-N-E-Y. Uh, so you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter or a Facebook page, Andrew Maloney Boxing. Um, yeah, so really appreciate you following me and appreciate your support. Excellent. Okay, listen, Andrew, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you, my friend. Best of luck moving forward. We'll certainly be uh, keeping our eyes peeled for what's next with you. Hopefully in the next couple of days we hear something. Um, and, yeah, just cannot wait to see you in a ring again soon. Thanks for your time. Nah, thanks, Joey. Appreciate your time, mate. Thank you. Okay, and this wraps up episode 240 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Umar Ahmed of IFL TV has been with me for the duration of the show. A massive thank you to our sole guest on this week's podcast, the reigning WBA Super Flyweight World Champion, Andrew Maloney. I want to thank you all for listening to this week's podcast. If you do get the chance, please head over to www.com. 
Um, BritishPodcastAwards.com forward slash vote. When you arrive on the page, it'll ask you to search for your desired podcast. Type in the box hard boxing podcast um, and give us your vote. It's free to vote and you can only vote once. So if you do get the time, that would really mean a hell of a lot to us. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe and we shall see you all again next week.